Let's do it. Hello, everyone. I'm Kimberly Adams. Welcome back to Make Me Smart, where we make today make sense. It's Friday, April the 5th. And I'm Amy Scott in for Kai Rizdal one more day. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast and on the YouTube live stream. This is, of course, Economics on Tap, our weekly happy hour episode. That's right. We're going to do some news. We're going to take a little break. We're going to play a round of half full, half empty. But of course, before uh, we get into it, we want to know what you're drinking. Uh, Hats off to Alcohol Responsibility Month. So I hope everybody's drinking responsibly this month and every month. Uh, But let's see, Amy, what do you have? I didn't know that was a month. Uh, Yes, it's April. I have to disappear for a second, show you the bottle. So this is, I'm drinking um, a hometown favorite from Colorado Springs. It's called The Deck. It's a mm-hmm. citrus clove liqueur. They call it an apres sport because you can see there's a, a skier on the front. But it's just it's that just a warm, very fancy, <laughs> delicious, yeah, liqueur. And so I mixed it with some bitters and a splash of soda and a cherry, and it's it's nice. You made it's yourself. Still, a I was saying it's so cocktail. cold in Baltimore. I see you. Yeah, I see I, you, you know I stepped it up. Ooh, nice I have to see when, and everything. when I saw that you were going to do something fancy, I felt like maybe the Miller Lite in my fridge wasn't going to cut it. So here we go. <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel like I've been kind of slacking on the cocktails lately, so I wanted to actually oh. try this week. Um, so I looked at what I had, uh, asked Chat GPT for some advice, did some searching on the internet, and kind of comboed a bunch of different ideas, and I ended up up with a cocktail that's like whiskey, um, green chartreuse, um, some cherry blossom syrup that I still have because I'm clearly, clearly still in cherry blossom mode. Um, And what else is in this? Uh, Absinthe and some sparkling water. And, you know, I put a little dehydrated lime on the top. I don't know if you can see it. If I tip it, it'll spill. And that's a beautiful glass. Thank you. I got it at Goodwill. Um, even love, better I, love it that's where i get all my fancy cocktail glasses um but i have no name for it so i'll rely on the chat and uh everyone's imagination to see what i should call it oh fun but i like it i like it uh you, all right let's um, see what everybody naming cocktails before um we did i think we did yeah when we did our stonk tales when everybody was doing the meme stocks <laughs> We did um, meme stock uh, cocktails, and I tried to make several of them, and they were interesting. Um, But let's see what everybody's drinking in the chat. Uh, Barbara's got a Sauvignon Blanc from South Africa. Um, Lego Warrior, seltzer water and cherry juice. I love it because we're still in cherry blossom. Thomas Moore is drinking water. Uh, oh, expat Mike says good morning from Cherry Blossom Weekend in Central Japan. I've never Ooh. actually been to Japan or seen the cherry blossoms there, so I'm very jealous of you, Mike. Uh, let's Me see. Too. Michael just finished a mezcal margarita. Oh, Chuck, I'm so sorry that you lost your grand cat this week. That's a bummer. Aww. Um, Tyler is drinking uh, an old fashioned with the, the Wisconsin kind with brandy and sweet since uh, oh. you gave up alcohol. I didn't know there was a Wisconsin Lent. kind. Oh, gosh, that was a whole thing. Wait a minute. If you gave up alcohol for Lent, how are you having a brandy old fashioned? I don't understand. Anyway. Oh, is that? Uh, yeah. Mighty Unlikely uh, is having an Aldi's Blackberry Seltzer. And let's see what else we have. Margie drinking a Pineapple White Claw. Felicia with the Dragon's Milk Mocha Mint. Okay. Mm. I don't know what that is, but it sounds interesting. Oh, Adam says I should call it the Kai Absinthe. Or the <laughs> Phil says it should be the Since Make Kai Me is Smart absent, Tale. Am I picking up on a pun oh! there? I like it. I didn't get that. Thank you, Amy. Yes, Kai's absent. I get it. I like that, Adam. Good that job. That is a good one. But you can only drink Although... it when I'm on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Although Phil says, how about the Make Me Smart Tail? Um, That's good. There's an idea. Let's see. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? What else? Homebrew size on. <laughs> Water before day. Let's see what else uh peg is drinking a mango ginger tea all right so i'm gonna hop really quickly over to the discord to see what y'all are drinking over there ah okay 
Bob Bob from the future has the free Merlot, which is a non-alcoholic uh, red wine, which I've tried before. And uh, mm. that's for the weekend. Shout out to the non-alcoholic wines, which have gotten a lot better, I think, um, over the years. And I saw a story in the Washington Post, I think, about how the non-alcoholic beers have gotten so much better as well. Steve's mm -hmm. drinking a Diet Coke. Tim has a Carback Hoppadilla IPA. The names on these beers are so weird. Okay. Anywho, let's do some news. Amy, what you got? Okay. Well, I was thinking maybe you should name it like the earthquake special or something because oh, right. uh, you <laughs> felt the earthquake today. here today, right? Yes. Did you feel it? Yeah, no, I didn't. I'm in Baltimore. Uh, the earthquake was centered in New Jersey, but my husband upstairs did feel it. So I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? I was actually in this closet tracking a story. So maybe I was just concentrating or used to or the earth moving when I'm near it. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, there was this 4.8 magnitude earthquake um, in the Northeast today. And thankfully, there was no major damage. Uh, several airports did ground of, flights yeah. <laughs> for a little while just to be safe. Um, but I was, of course, thinking about earthquakes. And Elise Hassan sent me this story from Vox about the much bigger earthquake in Taiwan a few days ago. Um, mm. As you know, that was a, a much more serious earthquake, 7.4 magnitude. At least 12 people were, were killed, hundreds were injured. Um, but I think what, what's remarkable about that is that the damage wasn't more severe. It was the strongest earthquake in the country in 25 years, but they've adopted really strong building codes and they conduct earthquake drills and the, the tallest building apparently moved mm -hmm. barely just because of how it was constructed. Is that the one um, with the big like ball hanging in the middle of yeah. it? Yeah. Yes, that is really interesting technology. And yeah. um, the story points out that, you know, not only does this preparation save lives, but there could have been a much more significant global economic impact because so much of the world's semiconductor manufacturing is based in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan makes 80 to 90% of the most advanced uh, computer chips. Um, you know, a lot of that takes place on the other side of the island away from the epicenter, so that's part of it. But in 1999, apparently an earthquake basically shut down the electronics industry mm -hmm. for a few weeks. And of course, back then, computer chips were not quite as critical to the global economy. So um, it just kind of speaks to the fragility of the supply chain and how concentrating industry in high risk places can can be risky. Well, I mean, but <laughs> given the world, what's not a high risk place? Very few. Yeah, I mean, Silicon Valley, <laughs> I think, is on how many faults so yeah it, it's uh it's not a problem that's going to be easy to solve but i think it does speak to how preparation really pays off and strong building it codes. really doesn't yeah if you get a chance to look at some of the articles about this i've seen some um sort of illustrations and and videos um showing this giant ball like literally hanging in the middle of the size skyscraper that absorbs the shock of it which is absolutely wild to me um okay cool i have two health related stories um the first one is uh <laughs> even though kai is absent he will he would relate to this which is about absent. allergies yes kai's absent <laughs> I'm going to be laughing about that for a while. Um, story in CNN that says, it's not just you. Here's why po pollen allergies are worse than ever. And it says, recent studies have revealed that growing zones in the U.S. are shifting as the climate warms, allowing plants and trees to expand their ranges. Rising temperatures also allowing plants to bloom earlier and longer, prolonging pollen seasons. Increased rainfall means plants release more pollen when they bloom and higher numbers of thunderstorms cause pollen grains to burst, making them more irritating and worsening symptoms. Shifting wind patterns in some parts of the world are carrying pollen over longer distances too. Let's also add in that they planted all those male trees in so many cities and with because they didn't want female trees because fruit and that, yeah. I, I say this as I wipe my eyes because allergies. So it is not. <laughs> I know. I'm just feeling the. I'm feeling you. it coming on. Yes, I know. I feel like it's psychosomatic in some ways. Like we were talking about it, made my eyes itch. 
Um, so that's one thing. I feel very validated as I've been like, you know, popping allergy pills like candy. Um, <laughs> but the other story, uh, a lot more serious, uh, but uh, good news. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration is making plans, I'm quoting here from the Wall Street Journal, to significantly expand the number of gay and bisexual men who can donate sperm anonymously, uh, similar to the rules that banned gay and bisexual men uh, from donating blood for a long time. They were also prohibited from donating sperm under certain circumstances because of um, fears of the spread of HIV. Obviously, newer research and, and more up-to-date information shows that that's not as big of a risk as people thought it was. And so under a proposal in it is drafting, the FDA would eliminate the broadband and instead adopt more pointed screening questions to assess HIV risk According to people familiar with the agency's decision, the proceed proposed changes would also apply to donations of all other cells and tissues, such as heart valves and ligaments, all things that people need in emergencies. This is supposed to be finalized uh, by the summer. I think this is um, particularly uh, you know, important because there is really a shortage of um, sperm donors for people who are trying to have kids. I mean, there was a story in the Washington Post a while back about how it's particularly uh, difficult for people, for Black women who are trying to find Black sperm donors to mm. get, um, you know, what they need. And so, like, I'm trying to see here, it's... Um, Right. Sperm banks, this is back in the Wall Street Journal, sperm banks have been experiencing shortages of donors, especially donors of color. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the problem as young professionals and university students who often compose a large portion of prospective donors left cities. So this is going to mean a lot to a lot of families uh, who rely on sperm donors to have their kids, assuming that IVF is, is still allowed in the future. But <laughs> clearly we don't know. There's that. Yeah. And so those policies really came out of the 1980s AIDS epidemic and the the less reliable testing. So the, the way that officials dealt with it was by just banning this Blanket entire bands. group from donating sperm. And that that's really outdated because testing has come a long way. Um, and so it's, it's great to see this change for, for many reasons, as you pointed out. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that is it for the news. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to play a round of Half Full, Half Empty, and we will be right back with that. All right, welcome back. It is now time to play our game, Half Full, Half Empty, hosted by the wonderful Drew Drawstad. Drew, take it away. All right. First up, are you half full or half empty on X restoring some blue check marks <laughs> to users that had them taken away? Kai was so upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kai got one. So for <laughs> Oh, did you have a blue check mark before? I did have one before, but I didn't get it back. And I've basically abandoned X altogether. So yeah. And I don't have a huge following. Um, I'm half empty because what is even going on at that place? I mean, you know, it's it's ridiculous. It's it seems like a, an attempt to stay relevant, and you know, I mean, they got cares? the head, they got themselves back in the headlines. They got a bunch of people to log back in who probably hadn't logged back in in a while just to check and see if their blue check marks were restored. So, as That's a gimmick, right. Um, right. I guess that works. Um, half empty Twitter has. I'm sorry, X is is not what it needs it's not doing what it needs to be doing shall i say um but i was very entertained by all of the reactions to it um michael harriet had the most entertaining response let me see if i can pull it up quickly um who, michael harriet is is a writer who writes a great deal about sort of race and ethnicity and, and culture and things like that. And let me find it because I sent it to Kai because I was entertained. And he, yeah, Michael Harry Kai, responded. Kai's response was an expletive. <laughs> yeah, we're not going <laughs> to say that. got the, but, the news. <laughs> So Michael Harriet responded to someone who was complaining about the fact that they were getting charged 
an annual premium for their blue check mark, but all these other people were getting their check marks for free. And Michael Harriet says, why are you mad that some people don't have equal access to the same privileges? Now you want X to repay you just because you helped build their platform? It was a different time. Instead of begging for a handout and whining about blue supremacy, maybe you should pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get more followers. Aren't you people tired of playing the victim? <laughs> Oh, that's good. that's good. I was chuckling quite a while as a result of that one. <laughs> Anywho, all right, what's the next one, Drew? Half full or half empty on the enduring popularity of denim jeans. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth Troval did a great it. piece about how like even though gen z tried to kill jeans <laughs> they haven't succeeded um this was when levi's reported its earnings and they were down actually but better than expected and uh and i you know i'm wearing a pair right now what can i say that's my that's my thing that's my uniform so i'm half full <laughs> <laughs> i have like one th like kind of base level uniform that i wear from like september to may which tends to be some version of boots, jeans, and a top and or a jacket to go with it. Um, it was funny one time when, when Lizzie O'Leary who used to host uh, Marketplace Weekend, I, I ran into her at the New York Bureau and we were wearing literally the same uniform and we were like, is this, is this the journalist lady uniform? But anyway, I love, I love jeans. Boots, jeans. It is, because I've top. seen you wear that yeah. too. <laughs> oh yeah, it's pretty much what I live in. Except, yeah, when I have a fancy interview, which doesn't seem to happen and then as you much put on anymore because it's all remote. You know, I do worry about the future of jeans, though, because my children, who are just two kids, but I think pretty representative, um, don't wear hard pants, <laughs> what they call hard pants. The youth like comfort and, you know, the whole athleisure trend. It's, you know, it, it really has eaten into the jeans appeal among younger people. So we'll see if they come I around. I have to say, as I think about it, all of my jeans are stretchy jeans. I don't know that I have any hard pants at all. Well, they don't understand that they don't have to be hard. <laughs> I know. It's like, I, I don't it's like anything like, with some form is restricting. Yeah. yeah. But I also don't have the body shape to pull off like a tapered leg jean type situation. Anyway, half full on jeans. I'm all for it. They're comfortable. They're durable. Um, hopefully we can lessen their climate impact and, and yeah, you good know, point. find a way to make good it work. Point. Okay, from 1971 to 2021, multi-generational households in, um, in the, the number of multi-generational households in the United States has quadrupled. Are you half full this or half empty? Me. Oh, I'm half full. I mean, I, I heard, uh, was it Chris Farrell's piece this morning on the, the morning mm -hmm. report, interviewing a family that, that lived together, an immigrant family, and talking about how that is a huge support network. And I mean, there are some less positive reasons I think this is happening because of the cost of housing and the unavailability of housing. But I mean, I think being close to different generations is great for happiness and well-being, generally speaking. So as long as it's not like forced multi-generational mm. living, I'm half, half full. I'm half full on multi-generational housing. I think you know, when I was living abroad, I, I saw this in practice and it really was helpful in a lot of ways. And it also taught people, I, I think they had better ways to manage interpersonal relationships because if you're sharing mm. space with people across generations, you kind of have to find a way to communicate and talk to people and manage and maintain boundaries and, and things like that. Um, as long as, you know, there's no like, it, it, you know, weird dynamics. But I will say um, one of the things I think Chris pointed out in that piece was that some of this has to do with caregiving. And because we have such a shortage of caregivers, whether it be child care or elder care, some of this multi-generational family is as a result of people just needing to be in the spaces for care assistance. And I would rather see better social supports for that. Um, but on the other hand, only because I know so many people, especially people my age, 
who would like to be out in the workforce more fully, but are now in situations where they have to provide elder care. And even though they love their older loved ones, they would rather there be a system to be taking care of them. Similarly, you know, friends of mine who would rather not have their in-laws or their parents all up in their space, but they need their help with childcare. Yeah, that's why the shed is a good, good option. <laughs> if <laughs> you have a backyard, the care, there's a little to separation. To put the in-laws or to put the... Ah, to whoever, escape. yeah, yeah. <laughs> whoever, whoever needs to be there. I'll take the shed, maybe. <laughs> all right, what's next? Half full or half empty on earthquake memes. <laughs> oh. I'm all the way full. I enjoyed it. I, I especially love the dynamic of all the West Coast people trying to cast shade on the East Coast people for reacting to uh, the earthquake. And uh, I'm on Blue Sky more than I'm on Twitter now. And there were all of these scientists saying, like, look, the East Coast is bedrock and shakes travel further when it hits a rock as opposed to on the west coast where you really don't feel it in a meaningful way when it's a 4.8 or whatever anyhow i don't know any of these things i'm not an expert in this field but i'm entertained by the discourse i'm entertained by the memes half full okay so i missed all the memes i was not on social media today give me somebody give me a sample so healthy <laughs> I mean, it was just people reacting, basically talking about how pe people on the East Coast lose their minds when there's a mild tremor compared to people on the West Coast who are just like, yes, it's Tuesday. and that's true. I was telling somebody, I, the last one that I felt here in Baltimore was in 2011, I think. And I used to live in California. I know better, but the earth started shaking. And what did I do? I ran for the door. Like, you're supposed to stop. <laughs> and protect yourself right take shelter you're not supposed to like most injuries happen trying to exit the building so like wherever it happens it's kind of scary so you know get, go easy on one, us west coast people the funniest one i saw only because i related so deeply is someone said my tornado alley self uh ran felt an earthquake and ran to the basement <laughs> because we're trained <laughs> We're trained Wrong in a disaster to, to go to the basement to protect yourself from danger. And that is not what you want to be doing in an earthquake. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. We should post some like news you can use for people. Don't go to the basement. Don't go to the basement. <laughs> Don't run out earthquake. the door. That is, that's Find not a the, sturdy that's not piece the... of furniture, get under it, or a doorway, right? Are we, are we right, Drew? I was you in live in very... California. Yeah, what, what are the, the rules, doorway Drew, thing, tell us? I think the doorway thing is might actually be a myth. I think that oh, you're shoot. just supposed to, like, cover your head, get under a table. Yeah. Okay. Ah, interesting. It's funny how those things change. Hmm. Okay. Is this Not the last one, Not 100% on Drew? that, though I probably should be. Um, <laughs> yes, this is the last one. All right, folks in the YouTube live chat, do not take our advice on emergency preparedness. Get that information from your local emergency management uh, source of whatever that is not us. And if you're in the YouTube live stream, please get ready to vote in our poll. And while you're there, if you can give us a like or a thumbs up or all the things, we'd appreciate it. All right, let's go. Are you half full or half empty on traveling for the solar eclipse? Mm. My mother is traveling for the solar eclipse because the solar eclipse, uh, like the, what do they call it? The path of um, totality. 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 Thank you. The path of totality. Um, oh, wow. That closed super quick. Let's reopen it again. Reopen the poll because it closed like very quickly. Um, anyway, uh, my the path of totality passes through um, the Bloomington, Indiana, where my mother and her siblings spent a lot of time growing up. And uh, so she and some of her siblings are going up to uh, Bloomington to watch a solar eclipse for the day. I do not envy them the traffic. Um, I'm going to be very content with my partial eclipse here in D.C. and, and look at it with glasses that I'm going to go get from the library tomorrow. Um, but, uh, yeah, I... Um, I am not going anywhere. Are you traveling at all? Mm, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, you may remember I, I went to 
St. Louis for the last one. I think you were in town I, too. Oh, and, oh my yeah. gosh, we saw each other. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It, it was it was all a blur because my 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 sister had just passed, and you very kindly came by to to visit me and my mom. Um, but yeah, I actually watched the um, eclipse in St. Louis with my mom. It, it was a really dark period of time, but that was so nice of you that you came and visited us. Yeah, but did did you get to yeah. watch the eclipse there? We we did, and it was, I mean, it was breathtaking. It was such an incredible experience. Oh, that that's I right. Kind you of brought me glasses. If I ever had a chance, yeah, we had an extra pair of glasses, right? Because there was because we couldn't find them in St. Louis, and you brought us eclipse glasses. Oh my gosh, I had totally forgotten about that. Amy, you're such a good person. Well, you had a lot going on, <laughs> but anyway. Exactly. So, and I, my husband is is like kind of ridiculous about wanting to see it so he's booked a bunch of different options for us and we're watching the weather mm. it's so you know if if the weather's clear in one of the places we can get to we are probably going to go so that I'm, yes. I'm setting up my answer but should we see what how people answered in the poll yes okay so uh solar eclipse travel half full 64 percent Half empty, 35%. So it looks like lots of folks are in favor of travel, but um, I'm curious if anybody is there, are you act anybody in the chat to tell us uh, where you're actually traveling? Debbie Donovan says, we booked in August flights, car rental, hotel. Um, Jin Peck says, family heading to Albion for the day. Um, let's see, yeah, okay. And where are you going, Amy? Uh, so, it depends on the weather. We have um, a St. Louis plan and we Ooh. have a Boston plan because actually the weather's looking better in the Northeast right now, like far North mm -hmm. Burlington, Vermont, Maine. Um, but I also have like, I'm a, I, I guess I'm half full, but I also have some guilt about the climate implications of, of flying to see something. It's, it feels very selfish, honestly, to, to me. To see something that lasts um, four minutes. And yeah, it's such an extraordinary experience. I mean, I don't know if you remember the the experience well, of totality, okay. Celebrities but it's, have there's nothing jets, like so it. You're going to be okay. So, yeah, I'm not <laughs> flying my private jet. But anyway, yeah. I, this is a complex thing for our family. I've been uh, feeling a little bit bad about all of these plane tickets that my husband has booked. We'll see if we go anywhere. I'll report back. <laughs> Cheryl Lindstrom says we're driving 12 hours to Texas, but they uh, but Cheryl has family there. Uh, let nice. me hop over to Discord. I really Anybody hope the weather is good in Texas. The, the, the forecasts have been a little iffy. Uh, let's see. Merica from Kansas City is driving from Kansas City to St. Louis on Sunday, but driving south at like 5 a.m. Fair. Oh, yeah. Um, the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's jokes about flying to the eclipse because it's very high. Ha ha ha. ha. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Yeah, good time for the music. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody has jokes today. Kai's absinthe. Oh my gosh. I think I know, that's you know what good. I've decided. That's the name of the that's the name of the cocktail. Kai's absinthe. <laughs> Cheers. Love it. Cheers. That is it for us today. Kai will not be absent. He will be back on Monday with me. And in the meantime, if you have a question or a comment that you want to share with us, leave us a voicemail at 508-UB-SMART or email us at makemesmart at marketplace.org. Make Me Smart is produced by Courtney Bergseeker. Today's episode was engineered by Charlton Thorpe, who's the only one who gives us a warning before we go live. And our intern is Talia Menchaca. The team behind our Friday game is Jamila Huxtable, Emily McCune, and Antoinette Brock. Marissa Cabrera is our senior producer. Bridget Bodner is the director of podcasts. And Francesca Levy is the executive director of digital and on demand. And on demand. There it is. Got Thanks it everybody time. who tuned in on the live stream. Y'all are always lots of fun. Let's see. Oh, and there's Jasper hanging out. He wants to be part of the show.